I love to tell the story, more wonderful it seems, than all the golden fancies of all our golden dreams. I love to tell the story, it did so much for me. And that is just the reason I tell it now to thee. I love to tell the story, twill be my theme in glory to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. Have you heard this expression, the accident already occurred? I understand they use it in the military. Is that familiar to anybody? The accident already occurred. We're just waiting for the plane to get to the crash site. (laughs) This is a significant statement because many times there's a decision made, an error made, maybe it's a pilot error or malfunction of equipment that happens at this point, but the crash is over here. But many times a person takes an action and disastrous result of the action is miles away from where the action took place. And that we're going to see in our story today. And we've seen it before and you see it lots of times, you've seen it in your own life, where you make a decision but the horrible consequences of the decision might be a year away or two years away. And we're gonna see that in our lesson today. We're gonna talk about foolishness You never have to look far for that, whether you're in your own home or in the government. So what kinds of things do people consider foolish? (laughs) Grabbing a tiger by the tail is clearly a foolish act, right? A lot of us are going to do that, we wouldn't think. Uh, What's the old Jim Croce song? Everybody remember Jim Croce? Bad, bad Leroy Brown? Baddest man? It's one of some things you don't do. Don't spit into the wind. You don't tug on Superman's cape. You don't want to make Superman mad, so you don't tug on his cape. You don't spit into the wind. You don't pull on a tiger's tail. But what else? I mean, what are some more common things that people consider to be foolish? Playing LSU at home. Playing LSU at home. (laughs) There are lots of people who would attest to that. What other things? statement you can't back up. Make a statement that you can't back up. Are there people who would consider your being here this morning foolish? I mean, they think you're foolish for being here, right? And you think they're foolish for not being here. People spend more than they make. People who spend more than they make. Happens all the time. And some people would consider that foolish. The people who are doing it don't consider it foolish. What kinds of things do people think God considers to be foolish? What they don't believe. If they believe it, then that's a good thing. But if they don't believe it, then they would think that God would consider that to be foolish. All right? Certainly there are people who are going to think that. If you stop people on the street, do they have a good idea, an accurate idea as to what God considers to be foolish? Probably not. Probably not. If you just randomly stop people on the street, Their idea of God and who God is and what he desires and what he thinks is wise and what he thinks is foolish might be pretty foolish. I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. I'm going to tell you what Scripture says, and we'll come back to this later on, so I won't deal with it in any great detail here. Things that God considers to be foolish. Things that are contrary to his commands. Now, we would buy that, wouldn't we? Anything that's contrary to his commands... God would consider to be foolish. I mean, it is not very wise to do things that are contrary to his commands. It is not wise for a person to be disobedient to God's directions. So God would consider that to be foolish. Things that are distractions to his will. We are easily distracted, aren't we? Show us a little shiny object and we'll go follow it immediately. I mean, anything that gets our attention. But those things that are distractions from where he wants us to go would be foolish in God's eyes. 
So a foolish person is a person who's easily led astray, away from the path that God would have for you. Works of the flesh, those things that are designed to fulfill our desires, our pleasures. Those works of the flesh, and Paul gives you a long list of those things, but those things are contrary to God's will, and those are things that God would consider to be foolish. So when we're involved with those things, we're foolish people. And then finally, those things that are built on malice, envy, and hate. Now, you may find that a strange list, but I've taken it from Scripture, so I'm going to show it to you later. Things that are built on malice, where we're trying to hurt somebody, or envy of somebody, or upon hatred for somebody. We're to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and our neighbor as ourselves. I mean, and that has nothing to do with malice, envy, or hate. So if we are building anything on malice, envy, or hate, then God's going to say that's a foolish thing. When we think about what God calls foolish, it's quite different from what human beings might consider to be foolish. And everybody has an idea about what they think is foolish. But when we talk about foolishness, we're talking about things like these. That's foolishness. And people are foolish when they participate in those things when they are disobedient to God, when they are led astray, when their lives are built upon pleasure, and when they are, in fact, heavily involved, deeply involved with malice and envy and hate. So why do foolish things sometimes appear to be wise? And wise things appear to be foolish. Why are we calling these things wise when they're foolish and calling these things foolish when they are wise? Well, Gerald, there, I think there's this pragmatic element that sometimes the foolish things that we think are wise seem to work well, they, uh, like the worldly wisdom that if two people live together before marriage they get to know each other better and save money in the process and right have make an economic factor the statistics don't bear that out that doesn't I'm sure them are good so there are factors that will help you rationalize the error even though it may be foolishness you may think well this is a pretty good idea what else? Something we want so bad. I mean, that desire is there and we want it, so we'll rationalize it. We'll justify it one way or the other. We're going to get what we want. We can do things without God's help and we accomplish this, so we didn't need him for that, so that was a wise decision. Mm -hmm. Step out on our own and do these things. This is why I put the previous slide up where we talk about what God considers to be foolish. Because people will consider a foolish thing wise and they'll consider a wise thing foolish because they don't have the right perspective, do they? They're getting that very personal point of view. For my pleasure, is it something that you know, I can do on my own? Is it something that seems to work and benefits me in some way? It's really what I wanted to do in the first place and so therefore I find a good reason for doing it. When we don't have that proper perspective, then it's going to be easy to call the foolish wise and the wise foolish, isn't it? That's what human beings do when they have the wrong focus. So why do unbelievers do foolish things? Yeah, they don't know in the first place, do they? The unbeliever doesn't have a clue other than the basic thing that God has built into every human being, as you read in Hebrews, but generally he's just ignorant, isn't he? They may be very intelligent people, that's why I have Richard Dawkins' picture on the front, by the way, if you didn't recognize him. Because in, from the world's point of view, Richard Dawkins is a brilliant man, right? He is a brilliant man. And he's making this argument for the atheists. But he's a fool. He's a fool. Not understanding the difference between foolishness and wisdom. So they're going to do foolish things, aren't they? That's the natural thing. To do what seems good, what seems to work you know, built on this other philosophy, or to do, you know, the things that I can do on my own, or the things that are pleasurable for me, something I just desire. I have no restrictions on that, do I? If I'm an unbeliever, then why shouldn't I go after the thing that I really want? Why should I be concerned about other people's morals or other people's view of what's right and wrong? I should do what I want, the way that I want, when I want. So they're going to do foolish things. But what about the believer? Why does the believer do foolish things? Straight away from God. There is a straying, isn't it? That being led astray, getting off the path. 
We've all gotten off the path on occasion. I think maybe sometimes it's praying with friends influence your decision. Peer pressure, the people around you, and maybe advisors. I mean, you may have a trusted friend, somebody who's really close, who seems wise, who's giving you advice on a certain thing. And it may not be good advice. When foolishness reigns, and boy, we see that in lots of situations where it seems that everything is foolishness, contrary to the will of God, and that's just the way everything seems to be going around you. How can you in that situation remind yourself that God is in control of even that chaos? Prayer. Prayer. Don't we get caught up in that once in a while? When everything seems to be foolishness. And political campaigns are great opportunities to experience this, right? When everything seems to be foolishness. Sometimes you can look back at history. Because you can see God's hand at work when all this foolishness is taking place. And yet God still brings everything back where He wants it to go. When do people consider a decision to be a foolish decision? When the results are painful, right? I mean, it's when it doesn't work out the way we wanted and we hurt. I mean, something goes dreadfully wrong, didn't come out the way we thought, and there's some pain involved for us. Or maybe it's pain on somebody else close to us that we really care about. We do something foolish and somebody else pays a deep or a heavy price for that foolishness that we have committed. Why do leaders make foolish decisions? Political reasons. Political reasons. They do have their own desires for accomplishing certain things and think that it's wise to make that political move. But they're just human beings, aren't they? They're just people, believers. They're unbelievers. They're just like everybody else. And they are going to make some foolish choices on occasion, aren't they? You make, on occasion... A foolish decision because you're going to base it on something other than what God is telling you to do at that moment. Now you do it, I do it. Hopefully we all don't do it as much today as we did a year ago. And maybe next year we'll do it a whole lot less than we do it today. But we still do it. But leaders, problem with leaders making the foolish decisions is because of the impact upon so many other people, isn't it? When that leader walks off the cliff, then a bunch of other people are going to be falling off that cliff as well before they realize, hey, this is not a way to go. So great damage can be done on the part of a leader when foolish decisions are made. The movie clip I have for you this morning is from the movie Elizabeth, uh, 1998. It is rated R. It is a good movie anyway. I mean, you just have to, there's some things in it you don't want to see. But overall, it is a good movie with a good theme, and it does deal with leadership. Queen Elizabeth of England. It's a movie about her life. This is about her early part of her life. There's a sequel, Elizabeth the Golden Years, which is about the most important years of her reign. But this is about the early part as she becomes Queen of England. Now, there's several reasons I want to use this. One, it is an excellent lesson on leadership. And secondly, I get to talk a little bit about the history of the Bible, which I think is important for all of us to remember. First of all, the printing press was in 1450. Gutenberg in Germany had the first printing press in Europe. And a few years later, printed the first printed Bible. Prior to 1455, every Bible in existence was handwritten. And I would like for you to learn how to appreciate what it means to have a handwritten Bible. If you would just take a reasonably long chapter of the Bible, a book would be better, but take a reasonably long chapter. Pick a chapter 7 of Romans, something like that, just and write it out. And make sure that you have every word precisely right, every spelling exactly right, and see how long that takes you. Then figure out how long it would take you to copy the entire Bible. See, we have no appreciation for that. We have word processing now. You know, we just... And the errors all correct and everything's fine. But copying the Bible, that's how they were done until 1455. The first one was printed. It was Latin because it was the Latin Vulgate. Latin was the language of the church, the Western church at least, for 1,400 years. Shortly after that, Martin Luther in 1517 nailed the 95 theses to the door of the church in Wittenberg, the birth of the Reformation. 
But then in 1522, he printed the New Testament in German in the language of the people, not Latin, the language of the church, but the language of the people of Germany. Printed, that meant that lots of people could get copies of this. When they're handwritten, you don't just get one. You have to be filthy rich or in the church to have one of those things. But printed, now people can get these. And then a few years later, he had the Old Testament in German. So the Lutheran Bible, just the Bible translated into German from the original Greek and from the original Hebrew. When you carry this Bible around, not only do you have the miracle of something that is just printed and available to everybody, but it's in your language. And the things that people went through to get it into, to you in your own language. The other thing here I want to bring in now is King Henry VIII. That's a familiar picture to many people. King Henry VIII, who reigned in England from 1509 to 1547. Now, King Henry liked his ladies. But Henry VIII is important in the development of the Bible in English. Henry liked his ladies, had a girlfriend early in life. He had a, a girlfriend he really liked, but he had a sister he liked better. But he, and he, he was sleeping with a girlfriend, but he wanted to sleep with a sister, and she wouldn't do it, so he had to marry her. So he married her, Catherine, first wife of Henry VIII. He had a daughter by Catherine, Mary. We'll meet Mary in just a moment. Well, he grew tired of the first wife, Catherine. He had wives, but he had mistresses too. He just had a lot of ladies. But he had a mistress he liked better than his wife, so he wanted to divorce his wife. But see, the, the church now is still Catholic. And divorce could only be granted by the Pope. And Henry couldn't get a permission to divorce his wife. And so he said, uh, we need a new church. Church of England, and I'll be the head. I'll be the head of Church of England. Now, a lot of this is oversimplification, but it, you'll get the major point here. But Henry made himself head of the Church of England. So he's king of England, head of the Church of England. And it, it was neither Protestant nor Catholic. It was kind of, kind of halfway in between because all he really wanted to do was to be in control. So he, he got in control, was able to divorce his wife. She was later convicted of treason and heresy. But he divorced his wife so he could marry his girlfriend, Anne Boleyn. He ended up having six wives. Now, he had a daughter by the second wife, and that was Elizabeth for our movie today. He had several other children, only one son, Edward, who was considerably younger. And when Henry died in 1547, his son, who would be the heir to the throne, was nine years old. So Edward became king of England at the age of nine. Now here's the line of succession, because when he was ill, he knew he was going to die soon. So he said, now here's how the succession should go. It should, first of all, be my son. And so Edward was first. And then if something happens to Edward, it should go to Mary, my oldest child. So Mary would be queen. And if something happens with Mary, then Elizabeth. So you can imagine now something's going to happen to Edward and something's going to happen to Mary. First of all, Mary, Bloody Mary. King Henry was making a break with the Catholic Church, opening the door for Protestantism, even though he was Church of England wasn't truly Protestant at that point. But he's making the break from the church. Mary was a devout Catholic, and Mary undid everything Henry did and tried to bring England totally back into the Catholic Church. She had executed a large number of Protestants. The men who were translating the Bible into English, she burned at the stake. She murdered hundreds of Protestants, hence Bloody Mary. Mary died of cancer after a few years. Elizabeth became queen and reigned for 45 years. Now, when Elizabeth took control of the monarchy, England was in dire straits. It was almost bankrupt, very weak militarily, on the verge of collapse. When she left office 45 years later, England was the powerhouse of Europe and probably the world at that point. So a lesson in leadership should be here somewhere, but there are several lessons. One other name that I need to mention before we go to the clip is Mary of Guise, who was Queen of Scotland. Now she married, Edward wanted to marry her too. Of course he wanted to marry everybody, but he wanted to marry Mary. But she had a daughter named Mary also, Queen of Scots. So sometimes when you're reading through this, you kind of forget, am I dealing with mama or daughter or which one? But in the movie, you're going to hear a reference to Mary of Guise. Now, she was Queen of Scotland, 
And she also wanted to bring the nation back to Catholicism. That was her desire. But Elizabeth actually opened the door for the Protestants. Now, she assassinated a lot of her enemies, too, for treason or heresy, and maybe for good reason for some of them. But anyway, she also assassinated a lot of her enemies. Clips from four scenes. The first one is when she is not queen, and her sister Mary is debating whether to kill her or not. Because Mary's a devout Catholic, she knows that Elizabeth is not, and that if Elizabeth comes, becomes queen, then the Protestants are probably going to gain advantage. So it may be to her advantage to have Elizabeth executed. So Mary and Elizabeth meet. And so there's a brief clip in there where Elizabeth talks about, in a naive way, talks about what she would do if she were queen. The second clip is after Elizabeth become queen, almost immediately after becoming queen, there's a problem. The French have cut a deal with the Scots, Mary of Guise up in Scotland, to come with them and help conquer England and make it Catholic. England is very weak, militarily, almost broke. They have to make a decision. Do we go up into Scotland and fight the French who've come over? So she's in her council with her advisors, and she's going to get some foolish advice, and you'll see how she deals with that in her, as a novice leader. Then the next scene, they do go to battle with Scotland and they are badly beaten. And what Mary of Guise does is she takes the, the French colors, puts them on the wound of a wounded teenager, British, who was wounded in battle. She wipes his blood on the French colors and still tells him, go back and tell your queen to not send children to fight her battles. Elizabeth gets this news. And this third scene is where Elizabeth is told that they have been defeated <laughs> and that the bishops of the church are out for her head. And you'll see Elizabeth see the picture of her father, King Henry VIII, and how she reacts to that. And then the last scene is after Mary of Guise has been assassinated, and her advisors are saying what she has to do to pacify France and Spain to avoid a bigger war and to hopefully save the kingdom. And you'll see her take another stance with regard to leadership. So those are the four scenes. Take a look. You will promise me something mm -hmm. when I am gone. You will do everything in your power to uphold the Catholic faith. Do not take away from the people the consolations of the Blessed Virgin, their Holy Mother. When I am Queen, I promise mm -hmm. to act as my conscience dictates. Madam, I'm afraid the French mean to attack while we are still weak and while your majesty's reign is still uncertain. What is your counsel? Madam, we must with all haste raise an army to march upon Scotland. Can we not send emissaries to There is no time for that! As Queen, we look to you for action, unless you are content to wait for the French to send more reinforcements. My father would not have made such a mistake. I have been proved unfit to rule. Why did they send such children? Why did they not send proper reinforcements? Because the bishops would not let them. They spoke against it in the pulpits. Then they are speaking against their queen. Madam, the bishops are against you and have no fear of you. I, I really must The insist. word must is not used to princes. I have followed your advice in all the affairs of my kingdom, but, but your policies would make England nothing but either part of France or Spain. From this moment, I am going to follow my own opinion. 
quite a transition from the beginning to this point. This is the beginning of the reign of Queen Elizabeth. Let's go to the story. King Solomon had how many wives? Too many, way too many. 700 wives and 300 concubines. 700 wives and 300 concubines. Now, this is not a good start. But here's the problem. His wives turned his heart away from God. His wives worshipped the idols of the countries from which they came. They were foreign women, marriages for political purposes, most likely. And they turned his heart away from God. God is not going to deal with that in an easy way. So the Lord was angry with Solomon, and he says he's going to tear the kingdom away from him. So Solomon, the wisest man. Now, isn't that how you know Solomon? Solomon's wisdom, the wisest man to ever walk on the face of the earth. What about this action? Foolish, absolutely foolish. Turned away from God, led astray by these wives. So he built these places of worship for these gods of his wives and even participated in the worship of those gods himself. Now, we have reason to believe that Solomon later in life turned around because in Ecclesiastes, which most of us believe that was written by Solomon, Solomon recognizes the foolishness of this kind of thing. All these other things that men seek in women and wine and wealth, vanity, emptiness. But God says, I'm going to tear the kingdom away from you. So in this foolish act, remember God's still in control. Here is Solomon surrounded by a thousand women. God is still in control. So the Lord raised up adversaries. He raised up a couple of them, one from Edom and another one. But the important one is Jeroboam. Jeroboam, that's a name that we need to remember. Jeroboam also lifted up his hand. Because when God said to Solomon, I'm going to tear the kingdom away from you, he said, I'm going to give it to your servant. See, the kingdom should go to sons, right? That's the way it's designed, go to sons. But he says, I'm going to give it to your servant. Jeroboam is a servant. In verse 27, the beginning of the reason why Jeroboam revolted, get a little bit of the story in the next few verses. And Jeroboam is a servant to King Solomon. He is responsible for the conscripted labor. The people of Israel have had 40 years of peace. When David was king, there were lots of battles going on. David fought for territory and expanded the kingdom and got control of Israel from all the surrounding nations. So David's time was a time of war. Solomon's time was a time of peace. God's raising adversaries. That's unheard of. They've had decades of total peace. Nobody fighting with them. And now God's bringing up these adversaries who are causing these little skirmishes. People have been building. What does Solomon do? Well, he had built a temple. The primary thing you remember from him is he built a temple, right? Massive building project to build this glorious temple that God had designed. Well, who built the temple? Solomon didn't do it with his own hands. There were people, lots of people. Many workers were conscripted to do the work of building the temple. What else did Solomon build? Is that all he built? No, he had a big house for himself that he built. He built some other halls. He also built a big house for his wife, who was the daughter of Pharaoh, his Egyptian wife. And one has to believe that he had to have quarters for these other 1,000 women. That would be a major building project right there, wouldn't it? Well, Solomon has been building and building and building, and that requires labor and it requires money. And so they've had taxes on the people. And the people have had this going on now for 40 years, and they're getting kind of tired. You know, how many more houses are you going to build, Solomon? What about the stables for his horses? And you've heard of Solomon's stables. He had all these horses, and he had people taking care of the horses. So the people have had a tremendous burden for a long time. One of the servants, one of the people, is Jeroboam. And as he's leaving Jerusalem at one point, he is encountering a prophet, Ahijah. Ahijah has a garment on him. He tears it apart into 12 pieces and gives 10 of them to Jeroboam. And God says he's going to tear the kingdom apart from Solomon and you're going to get 10 tribes. The rest will stay with Solomon's son. But you get 10 tribes. The kingdom is going to be divided. And Jeroboam is told that as he's given these. So he now knows that he's in line to be king over a whole bunch of these people. When Solomon hears of all this, he seeks to kill Jeroboam. 
Now, what's interesting here, if you stop and think about it for just a moment, is Solomon in his Proverbs talks about the wisdom of following God. I mean, Solomon was a wise man. He knows the wisdom of doing what God wants you to do. Now, here is something that God intends to do. He intends to tear the kingdom apart. He intends to give ten tribes to Jeroboam, and Solomon's trying to undo it. Is that foolish? That is a foolish act, trying to undo what God is doing. So Jeroboam then goes down to Egypt awaiting Solomon's death so that he can come back and do his job. So Solomon dies, and his son Rehoboam becomes king. It's interesting, Solomon had a thousand wives. We know of only one child. Now, I don't know how many children he actually had. We're only told of one, Rehoboam, the fool. So Jeroboam comes back to Israel. Rehoboam is the king. And the people went to Shechem to make him king. So everybody's gathering. Rehoboam's going to be the king. He's Solomon's son. He's going to be the king. Why did they go to Shechem? Where's the temple? Where did Solomon build the temple? Jerusalem. Where did David reign? Jerusalem. Solomon was always in Jerusalem. Jerusalem's the place. Has been for over 60 years. The temple is there. Why are they going to Shechem? This would be a hint that maybe something's on their mind. Getting him out of his home. You don't want to play him on his home turf, just like you don't want to play LSU at home. You don't want to play Rehoboam in Jerusalem. So you get him to Shechem. That's in the middle of the ten tribes to the north. You have the southern kingdom from here down, the northern kingdom from there up. Shechem is in the middle of this population of the ten tribes. That's bringing him up there and making him king. But also we're going to say, we will make you king and we will serve you if you will relieve us of some of this burden of labor and taxes. It's been going on too long. It's time for it to be pulled back. Didn't say take it off entirely, but just give us some relief. So that's the request they make. We will serve you if you'll do that. Rehoboam appears to be doing some wise things. He said, first of all, he says, give me three days and I'll give you an answer. Well, that's a reasonable thing to do. Seems like a wise thing to do. Give me time to really think this thing through and give you the right answer. Then he goes to his counselors who were the counselors to his father Solomon. Now, these would be wise men in general, but in any group of counselors and advisors, you will have wise men and you will have foolish men. But anyway, in this group, they come up with some pretty good advice. He goes to these wise men, these older men, and they tell him, you know, tell him that you're going to, you understand, you feel their pain, and you're going to deal with it in a way that's going to make them happy. You'll like what we'll do. We'll take care of you. But then he says, well, let me listen to my younger men, my old running buddies, the guys I used to run around with and see what they have to say. And they say, tell them you're going to raise their taxes. You're going to make them work more. So Rehoboam says, okay, sounds good to me. When they come together on the third day, then Rehoboam says to them, just what the young men said. You think you had it bad with Solomon. Wait till you see what I'm going to do to you. Now that's a way to win friends and influence people. But he's the king and they expect him to be able to do anything he wants as king. He doesn't listen to the people. And as we were reminded in Scripture, it was a turn of affairs brought about by the Lord. The foolishness that's going on, God is still in control. God is in control. So the people are upset and the famous line, what portion do we have in David? What part do we have in, in this kingdom of Israel? I mean, we're being treated like dogs. We don't need that. And so we'll have nothing to do with you. So here you have the beginning of the separation. All Israel heard, they found Jeroboam and made him king. Jeroboam, the servant out of Egypt, comes back home and is made king over the ten tribes, just like the prophet Ahijah had said. He is king of the ten tribes. And the only thing you have behind the house of David, behind Rehoboam, is Judah and Benjamin. So Rehoboam goes home and raises an army to go back and get his territory back. Raises 180,000 men. But a man of God came and spoke and said, God says, don't do it. Do not fight your own people. So he almost had a civil war you had a split like a civil war, but there was no fighting because God intervened. Even though Rehoboam went back and raised his army, God said, stop, don't do it. 
and they listened to the word of the Lord. So even in the foolish reign of Rehoboam, a little bit of wisdom sneaks out once in a while and you do the right thing and do what God says. And that's what he did. I have Titus 3, first 11 verses or so. One of the best exercises I can imagine is to sit down this afternoon and read those 11 verses. Sit there and think about them for about five minutes. Read them again. Think about them for five minutes. Read them again. Think about them for five minutes. Do that for about 30 minutes. And you're going to find some tremendous stuff in there. Paul is writing to Titus. Titus has a new church in Crete. So new believers. And he says, remind them to be submissive to the rulers. Hmm. No matter how foolish they may seem. Remind them to be submissive to the rulers. And to show perfect courtesy toward all people. Now there's some pretty good stuff. But that's not the part I want you to see. Then he says, for we ourselves were foolish. See, you can show perfect courtesy to all people if when you remember that you were foolish too. No matter how foolish they are, you were foolish too. And here he says, he says, what about, what is this foolishness? You were disobedient. Doing what he doesn't want you to do. You did that. So why are you so upset about them doing that? You did it. Led astray. The foolish are disobedient. The foolish are led astray. They get away from the path that God has for them. The walk that he has for them. They are led astray. There are slaves to various passions and pleasures. Well, you were slaves to various passions and pleasures. Why are you upset with them? Passing our days in malice and envy. We did that. Why are you upset with them? Hated by others and hating one another. We did that. Hopefully we don't do that now. Those are the foolish things. Those are foolish And if we fall back into any one of those things, we're being foolish as well. But don't be surprised and upset when someone is foolish. That's their natural state. I love to tell the story T'will be my theme in glory to tell the old, old story of Jesus and His love.